It was a cold Friday 175 years ago when people gathered on the banks of the River Bure in Great Yarmouth to witness the sight of Nelson the Clown perform his much vaunted stunt of being pulled in a washing tub by four geese. This virtual walk takes us around some of the sites that are relevant to this awful event and to commemorate those that died. We will start at the site of the suspension bridge itself, built by Robert Corey Jr. in 1829. We will go under the present bridge that leads to the Acle Strait, also part of Corey's project. Then visit the Vauxhall Railway Station. Following the pavement and footpaths, we will walk back to the other side of North Quay and then to row 6 to Northgate Street and turn right into White Horse Plain, stopping briefly at row 8, which follows the line of the present Fuller's Hill car park. Crossing the car park, we will be on the original line of Fuller's Hill, where the best known victim of the disaster lived. Crossing Northgate Street, we head towards St Nicholas Minster gates and pause before entering the churchyard itself looking at two particular memorials and the site of the former Priory School. Moving along Church Plain, we cross the road and enter the marketplace, and walking down the east side, stopping only to consider the resting place of more victims of the disaster. Finally, we pass the Market Gate shopping centre and into Theatre Plain, ending our walk outside Costa Coffee. In the early 19th century, this point on the River Bure was a crossing point to the marsh grazing that lay to the west, and a small pleasure garden on the other side of the river known as Vauxhall Gardens. It was originally served by a ferry carrying occasional livestock and visitors to partake of tea and play a game of bowls in the tranquil surroundings by the river. Its owner, Robert Corey Jr., who had been mayor in 1815, had plans, however, to construct a new road across the marshes to Acle and a bridge to access the town from the west. His bridge was to be a statement of his importance and legacy in the town. This he achieved in 1829, a fine suspension bridge, and in 1832 a turnpike road followed. Today nothing remains of the bridge, apart from a slight rise on the west side of the river where the roadway once was. What is here is a fine black granite memorial to the victims of the disaster, unveiled in September 2013. The memorial is due to the unstinting efforts of Julie Staff, a local resident who collected one pound coins from the townspeople and visitors to mark a memory of an event that has almost been forgotten in the history of Great Yarmouth. We now move under the present river bridge, along the riverside, and then follow the pavement. Cutting back towards the railway station and crossing the old Vauxhall Bridge, now no longer carrying railway traffic. In 1840, Robert Corey Jr. passed away, and his son Charles had taken over family affairs, which included revenue from the collection of tolls on the suspension bridge. The coming of the railway to Yarmouth, manifesting itself in the Yarmouth to Norwich line, was to change the economic prosperity of the town, like so many throughout the country. The railway company wanted to build its own bridge into the town and along the quay to load fish directly into wagons, but were not prepared to pay the quarries a fair amount for their rights over the river. The dispute had not been resolved by the time the railway was complete in 1844, and therefore the railway station was built on the Vauxhall side of the Bure. The acrimonious dispute was crucial in delaying any plans for a more suitable bridge that would take the additional weight of goods and traffic to the new railway station. This bridge, built by the railway company, only came 
after the collapse of the suspension bridge when the quarry sold their rights to the company following the disaster. If we wander down to the station itself, we will see a mural depicting Nelson the Clown in his washing tub sailing upon Braden water into the Bure. The crowd gathered in their hundreds on the bridge and wanting to get the best view surged to the south side. The suspension chain snapped, throwing mostly women and their children into the water. Tangled in the twisted metalwork and wooden walkway, if they did not drown, they were soon overcome by the icy water of the river or crushed by the tide surge against the dam that the fallen bridge had created. In all, some 78 did not survive. We now retrace our steps and crossing the road at the Pelican Crossing, past the supermarket, once the site of the Lakens Brewery. The brewery supplied barrels of hot water into which the lifeless bodies were plunged to try and revive them as the victims were dragged from the river. Under the underpass we walk east and up what is left of row 6. Row 6 has had a number of names in its time and perhaps was already known as Snatch Body Row following the mistaken belief that Thomas Vaughan, the Yarmouth body snatcher, had lived there in 1828. What remains of this row gives us a good sense of the cramped living quarters of many of the victims. Two victims lived here, Eliza Crow, aged 14, and Clara May, aged 20. One of the coroner's jury, who were required to visit the dead bodies in their homes, remarked, to attempt to describe the state of many of the families is together beyond our power. We have beheld scenes of misery which would soften the heart of the most insensitive and which caused intense pain to those whose mournful duty it was to enter their abodes. Passing out of row 6 and turning right into Whitehorse Plain, we reach the corner of the old coaching inn it is named after. Row 8 would have run down beside the inn towards the river and was called Ferry Boat Row after the original ferry that was replaced by the bridge. Here lived Harriet Bussey and her husband George, a shoemaker. They had paid into a burial club, a type of insurance in which one penny a week would go towards your burial. Rather touchingly, George at the inquest told the jury that he had made a rough wooden casket to hold her body for which he had been reimbursed by the club. Harriet's grave is in St John the Baptist churchyard in Lound, on which he had inscribed, Time swept by his overwhelming tide, my faithful partner from my side, and you of yours deprived, maybe as unexpectedly as me. Walking into Fuller's Hill car park, the dual carriageway by that name is slightly south of the original. Here two victims lived, Emily Young, age 6, and George Bellow, age 9. We shall learn more about the legacy George's family left in a while. Fuller's Hill was slightly more affluent than the roads to the north, and the main thoroughfare from the marketplace to the bridge at the bottom of the hill. Crossing over Northgate Street, we head east towards the railings of the Minster. On the railings themselves, you will notice the blue plaque showing that this was the site of the Guild Hall. It was here that W.S. Ferrier, the borough coroner, convened the inquest at midday the next day. Their task was to determine the cause of death of so many from the town and elsewhere. The bodies had been removed to the victims' homes and a route was drawn up to visit the families in turn. It took seven hours to do so, the last visited at nine at night. Unable to determine the cause and confused by the circumstantial evidence, they petitioned the Home Secretary to pay for an engineering expert to examine the evidence. James Walker came to the conclusion it was bad welding of a link in the chain when the bridge was constructed that was the primary cause. 
We now enter the churchyard and walk to the south porch. In the tiled floor is a stone marking the Robert Corey vault. The Robert Corey mentioned here may be his father, but neither he nor Robert Corey Jr. are buried here. The position of the purchase vault shows the importance of the family in the town. Leaving the porch and heading a short distance southeast, behind the railings we see the gravestone of George Bellow. This is the only remaining gravestone left commemorating a victim in the churchyard and is grade 2 listed. On it is depicted the fall of the bridge, with God's eye looking down on the victims as they fall. It's a most touching memorial. Passers-by cannot but be drawn to its message of calamity and redemption. Looking behind the gravestone, we see the old medieval priory. The Reverend Mackenzie, Vicar of St Nicholas at the time, believed the disaster was punishment for the sins and ignorance of the people of Great Yarmouth, and told his congregation so. He used the disaster to raise money to increase seating in the church and found a national school for the poor of Yarmouth. His work led to the old priory building being converted into a school in 1852, it remaining in the same building until 1999. Our walk now takes us over the main road and into the marketplace, passing the Fisherman's Hospital. Here we can stop outside the present Priory School. Hidden to the right of the school building is a secluded area beneath the town wall and its imposing tower. Known as the Dissenters' Graveyard can be found the tombstones of seven further victims. Jane Cole, aged 16, Hannah Field, aged 11, Alice Scotts, aged 51, Alice Scotts, aged 9, Harriet Little, aged 13, Matilda Livingstone, aged 6, and Joseph Livingstone, aged 7. It demonstrates how the disaster significantly affected families who often lost more than one child with the family member that had gone that day to look after them. Walking to the south side of the marketplace, we pass the 20th century shopping complex that is the Market Gates, and in the left-hand corner enter Theatre Plain, named after the theatre that once stood on the site of the block on the left. In 1845, apart from the theatre, this open space also provided the opportunity to erect temporary places of entertainment, and this is where William Cook had been given permission to put his wooden building that housed his circus. The first performance in Yarmouth had taken place on the 26th of March to sell out audiences, and the circus was moving on to Shoreditch for the Whitson weekend. As was often the case, the better performers were given what was known as a benefit night, in which they would take the takings towards the end of a run in the town. By then audiences would have dwindled, and in order to drum up a crowd, these performers often did stunts in order to bring in the crowds. Nelson's popular stunt was to be drawn by four geese in a washing tub on a local waterway. He had done it hundreds of times before, and it always worked. What could be better than to see a merry man make a fool of himself to understand what you might expect that evening? As usual, Nelson had flooded the town with handbills and posters, and therefore all that could and wanted to were likely to watch his journey from Yarmouth Bridge to the Vauxhall Gardens that late afternoon. And so we must end our walk. The tragedy not only affected the victims' families and the inhabitants of the town for the rest of their lives, but we are also told that Nelson was deeply affected by the event, suffering, as one reporter put it, of great mental and bodily anguish. He was not to live into old age himself, dying at 44 from an injury he received while performing some 15 years later. And so ends our virtual heritage walk. The Great Yarmouth Heritage Guides will be pleased to see you on one of our walks in the near future.